Is it too early for Wi-Fi 7 hardware adoption? Ubiquiti doesn't seem to think so and it has already made available its first Wi-Fi 7 access point, the U7 Pro. And while other manufacturers wanted to make a big deal out of it, equipping their access points with all the bells and whistles that they could, Ubiquiti took a slightly different approach. In a similar manner to the U6 Pro and the U6 Long Range, they opted to keep the U7 Pro fairly accessible, so it does look a bit less impressive on the paper than let's say the ingenious ACW536. But does it matter? We're still in the initial draft stage, so there will be issues with compatibility in the future, and lots of new features will probably require better or different chipsets. It's a bit of a gamble to invest in expensive Wi-Fi 7 hardware at the moment. In any case, the U7 Pro does support the 6GHz radio, it has 6 spatial streams and can be powered via PoE+. The multi-link operation is not yet supported, but Ubiquiti says that it will become available with future software updates. There are a few other very strange choices that have been made. One is the decision to go with a 2.5 gigabit port, most likely to keep the cost low. The second one is the decision to go with a fan. Yep, there is a fan inside the case to keep the temperature low. We will talk a bit more about it in the thermal section, so let's put the U7 Pro to the test and see if it's worth getting. The Ubiquiti U7 Pro is a bit larger than the U6 Pro, but actually smaller than the U6 Long Range. And the manufacturer has kept the same, now iconic, flying saucer design, which has a multicolor LED shining through the circular opening in the middle of the case. Unlike some previous generations, the U7 Pro is not IP rated and doesn't seem to have been built to withstand the elements. Although the top and bottom parts are glued together, as usual for ubiquity access points, I think that water can enter the opening for the fan. The mounting mechanism is fairly simple since all you need to do is to rotate the device into a base, and yes, this is a ceiling only device, lacking any fit to keep it steady on the desk. On the bottom of the access point, Ubiquiti has added a reset button on one side of the fan opening, while on the other side there is a single 2.5 gigabit port. As a comparison, the ingenious ACW536 has two 10 gigabit ports, while the Zyxel NWA130BE has two 2.5 gigabit ports. The latter actually being very close to the U7 Pro in terms of price. Certainly they must have put more budget somewhere else, so let's see what's the deal with this fan. There has been a lot of debate on whether Ubiquiti made a genius move when they added a small fan on the U7 Pro, or whether they have actually gone mad. There have been lots of complaints in the past that Ubiquiti access points run too hot, up to the point of plastic discoloration, so perhaps this was the only way the developers thought would fix the thermal issues. In my experience, the fan will not turn on as long as the temperature doesn't rise above a certain threshold. But what happens when it does? Is it loud? I can only hear it when I start up the U7 Pro. After that, even during the multi-client tests, I could not hear it, despite it being operational most likely at very low RPMs. And as you can see from the video, it does a fair job at keeping the case cool. But let's address the elephant in the room. What happens if the fan fails? You would think that Ubiquiti made the access to the inner parts of the U7 Pro easy, since the fan may need maintenance or replacement in the future. But now, you're going to need specialized tools like when opening a smartphone, otherwise the plastic case will get damaged and bye-bye warranty. The Ubiquiti access points are hard to open, and that's a fact I had to accept ever since the days of the UAP AC Pro, but for whatever reason it feels like the latest versions got better glued together, so it feels even harder with the U7 Pro. In any case, you can see the full teardown video here. So know that you need a prying tool, lots of patience and some bandages for your fingers. Also, the warranty will most likely be voided in the process. I have added the highlights of the teardown video here, and you can pause at any time to get a better view. Also, here's a comparison table with other access points. We already know that the multi-link operation is not yet a part of the Ubiquiti U7 Pro, but apparently will be in the coming days, it seems. But they did move the goalposts several times already. 
Anyway, we do get three radio bands, including the most wanted 6GHz frequency band and the 320MHz channel bandwidth, which is excellent. If you intend to use the 5GHz radio, then the limit remains 160MHz, of course. The U7 Pro remains 2x2 MIMO across all three radios, so no, the 6GHz is not 4x4, despite the fact that the possibility was there, considering the U's chipset. Some other features from the previous Wi-Fi gen are present here, including OFDMA and Mu MIMO, but of course both require compatible client devices. If you don't have Wi-Fi 7 or at least Wi-Fi 6 and 6E client devices, then there is little sense in investing in a Wi-Fi 7 access point at the moment. And that's about it for now. Let's see the access point in action. We have gotten accustomed to the single client test values and graphics. So let's start with them as well. I also made sure to include the signal attenuation, which is a far better metric to use than distance. This way you can actually produce these results in your own home. Understand that 5 feet with a lot of interference is not the same as 5 feet with no interference. While minus 40 dB is minus 40 dB regardless of the space where the access point is tested. If you check the other Wi-Fi 7 access point that I recently tested, the Ingenious ACW536, you know that I had a lot of trouble with the BE200 adapter from Intel, which made me pause the testing altogether for the 6GHz and wait for a Qualcomm alternative. Fortunately, I did manage to get one from MSI, the Herald BE NMC865, and I did use it to see how well the Ubiquiti U7 Pro performs. As for the 5GHz, I used the same Intel AX200 adapter and check the throughput using both the 160MHz and the 80MHz channel bandwidth, the former successfully using DFS channels. The results are impressive, the U7 Pro going above all other access points when the clients were connected to the 5GHz network. When compared to the U6 Pro and the U6 Long Range, it managed to outperform both of them, but remember that the test is done using a 2x2 Intel AX200 adapter. As for the throughput using the 6GHz radio band, we see some impressive results upstream above the ingenious ACW536, but downstream I saw an unexpected drop. I assume it's still an issue with the adapter, most likely in regards to the driver, but I will have to investigate further. At the end, I also had to include a slightly longer term performance graph to see how the throughput fluctuates without changes in terms of interference. Lately, I started to put less emphasis on the results collected using the 2.4 GHz radio band, and that's because it was pretty much left only for the IoT and generally smart devices. But I still got to see some very good results, especially when using the AX200 adapter. It's actually only second to the ACW536, which is a far more expensive access point. Not bad at all. I left the multi-client tests at the end, but that doesn't mean that they're not important. Quite the contrary, a multi-client test can show if an access point is able to handle various types of traffic at the same time. It's easy to run an iPerf test with a single client device, log the data and call it a day. But that's not going to reflect the real-life experience. So I relied on the same tools that I used before that are developed by Mr. Jim Salter and I started with a 1080p traffic simulation on 5 client devices at the same time. It's worth mentioning that these are the specs of the client devices and these are the specifications of the server device. Also, since the Ubiquiti U7 Pro has a single 2.5 gigabit port, I had to rely on a PoE Plus switch. But I did end up using the Behemoth Zyxel XS9030S that has multiple 10 gigabit PoE++ ports available. We also need to see the signal attenuation for each client to get a better idea about what we expect. With that out of the way, we can see that the U7 Pro handled the 5 simultaneous 1080p streams better than the ingenious ACW536 did. But is it enough for a good user experience? Well, the Wi-Fi 60 client did stay at about 50 milliseconds for 75% of the time, while the rest prefer to gradually get closer to 100 milliseconds. The MacBook Pro went above it for 10% of the time, which is far from ideal. 
Overall, it's not great, but still usable and the user will experience some occasional buffering. Moving on to the simultaneous 4K streaming, we can see that I put more strain on the U7 Pro. We can also see that a couple of client devices, the Wi-Fi 6E PC and one Wi-Fi 6 laptop stayed near 50 milliseconds for 75% of the time and managed to remain underneath 100 milliseconds for 95% of the time. While the other clients, especially the two Wi-Fi 5 devices, quickly raised above 100 milliseconds and stayed there for the entire duration of the test. Again, when compared to the ACW536, it's a better overall latency. It's now time to add the intense browsing alongside the streaming traffic, and it is worth mentioning that I made sure that I simulated the way a web page behaves by loading multiple 128 kilobytes of data at the same time, while also injecting 500 milliseconds of jitter. So, while the five client devices were streaming the simulated 1080p traffic, and furiously navigated the web, these are the results. We first check the 1080p streaming graph, and it's better than expected. We can see that one Wi-Fi 6 client device stayed below a near 50 milliseconds for 95% of the time, which is good, and the Wi-Fi 6e client remained near 50 milliseconds for 75% of the time. Only one client raised above 100 milliseconds pretty much consistently, and is the Zimaboard Mini PC, which is the most far away device out of the bunch. Moving to the intense browsing part of the test, we want a low latency once again, but it can go higher than one second, one second and a half if necessary, after which the user will get frustrated and will reload the page. And all clients behave nicely, with only one client going higher than the rest for 1% of the time. Now let's move to the 4K streaming and the concurrent intense browsing tests. Things do get difficult for the U7 Pro, but with the exception of the two Wi-Fi 5 clients, all others stayed below 100 milliseconds for 75% of the time. Other than that, we do see values above 100 milliseconds across the board, and the Zima board even raises near and eventually above 200 milliseconds. This means that the user will experience frequent buffering. But is the intense browsing experience good, at least? For four clients, yes, but one Wi-Fi 6 laptop did go above one second, which is borderline performance. Still a better latency than the ACW536. At least for now, because as we will see, adding the downloaded traffic into the mix pushed the U7 Pro to its limits. I started with two clients downloading 10 megabytes files continuously without any limit to the bandwidth they can use, and I didn't make any adjustments to the quality of service, it's all set to the default values. Two clients ran in test browsing traffic and the last one was simulating 4K streaming at a rate of 35 megabits per second. One downloading client had ridiculous latency values, almost 19 seconds, while the second one was still very high with values above 2 seconds and even reaching 5 seconds, far from good. The 4K streaming was handled better by the ingenious ACW536, while on the U7 Pro it's close to unusable. The intense browsing remained underneath 800 milliseconds for the entire duration of the test, which is passable performance. The total throughput that the downloading clients offered was 524 megabits per second. Moving forward, I allowed only one client device to run the downloading traffic while two clients browsed the web intensively and two were streaming 4K at 35 megabits per second max limit. The downloading client rose above one second and went far beyond it for 5% of the time, but it did stay at about 345 milliseconds for 75% of the time. Its throughput was 673.8 megabits per second. The 4K streaming was again handled poorly while the intense browsing clients managed to remain within the limits. I continued to lower the stress and only used three clients, one for downloading 10 megabytes files continuously, one for the 4K streaming and one for the intense browsing traffic simulations. Only the intense browsing provided acceptable latency values and it's interesting to see how the ACW536 performed so much better. Afterwards, I switched one of the three clients from 4K streaming to voice over IP but again then kept downloading traffic slow down everything 
even if it was moving 1 megabytes files this time. And it didn't really have much to show for it, since the throughput was on average 567.2 megabits per second, far from reaching the bandwidth limit. The conclusion is that you want to keep the downloaded traffic in check with quality of service, otherwise it can slow down the entire network. The last multi-client test is to simply let all clients' devices download the 10 MB file continuously and the results are as expected. The MacBook Pro showed latency values up to 2 minutes and a half. Yes, minutes. I know that the networking gear, especially the wireless access points, have moved towards a heavy reliance on a cloud platform, but the good news is that Ubiquiti lets you run an instance of the Unify locally, so I wasted no time and accessed it from my PC. You can run the Unify on most network attached storages, on a Raspberry Pi and there are even some routers that will let you run it as an additional app in the background. That being said, we do get to see some status data on the dashboard and there's also the iconic topology section where you get to see a map of your network. But we are interested in the Unify Devices section where you can access the dedicated options of the U7 Pro. Before that, understand that you can set up some general Wi-Fi settings that can be applied to any newly added access point. And this can be adjusted under radios. As you can see, I have configured three networks, one for each radio band, and they do get applied to any new access point, as long as there is compatibility. But returning to the dedicated options, we can see the inherited ones under settings. Here, we can also check some insights about the device and the networks, as well as get an overview of what's going on with the U7 Pro. Each client you connect to the access point can be visited under client devices and each gets the same overview, insights and settings trio available, but the control is fairly limited here. There are some more advanced options available if you go to settings, Wi-Fi and choose whichever network you want. Here you can create a hotspot portal which is useful for hotels and other similar businesses. Band steering is also available, so is client isolation, BSS transition and fast roaming. This last feature is necessary for a seamless transition between multiple access points. I should also mention that there is an app available as well called Unify and it offers pretty much the same options as the web-based interface that we have already explored. Should you get the Ubiquiti U7 Pro or should you go with either another brand or use the older U6 Pro or the U6 Enterprise? The answer is pretty simple. If you can't use the 6 GHz radio, then wait a bit more since the devices at the end of this year and during the next year will be better in terms of feature implementation. As you know, the multi-link operation is still not present on the U7 Pro. But even if used as a Wi-Fi 6 access point, it is only 2x2 MIMO, while the U6 Pro is 4x4. And yes, it can have an impact on the performance. Then again, I saw some very good numbers while testing the U7 Pro, so the decision is up to you. That's about it for today, thank you for watching and see you next time.